This presentation is a paid program. The opinions expressed are that of the host and sponsors and not that of KCOR, the core. The claims and representations made don't necessarily reflect the views or opinions of this network, its employees, ownership, or management. Receiving transmission. Commence radio program sequence. Channel check. Left channel, right channel, frequency check. Frequency check complete. All frequencies clear. It's time fearlessly to go into the abyss, into the world of the unknown, where fact and fiction collide. The paradigm matrix, a world where theories are abundant and the atmosphere of understanding is explored. Are you listening? It's time to drop that shroud of mystery and question what you think you know. It's time for The Paradigm Matrix. The Paradigm Matrix. And now your host and guide to the unknown, Will Miranda. On this Friday, October 4th, 2019, by the time Tokyo Friday, the Federal Commission will be classified as a matrimony to the Federal Commission and has a space of last two reasons. This is the KCOR Digital Radio Network for four, and I'm the host, Will Miranda. And I'd like to thank you for listening to the support and donations. I'd like to thank the Matrices for the team of the and my sponsor, TeamStructureShooters.com. Tonight, we are live from the Greater New England UFO Conference here in Lumberston, Massachusetts. Uh, tonight, we have a great panel of speakers. We have Paul Eno. We also have Dave McCullough from Squashashusetts. Cheryl Costa and Linda Miller Costa. Also, we have Paul and Benino, Jonathan Wolfs, and Alexander Petakoff. Also, Mike Stevens and our great author over here in Lumberstone, <laughs> Ronnie LeBlanc. All right. Uh, that's right. Dennis, where are you, Dennis? American Stonehenge. He is right here with us. Anyway, I'd like to uh, begin tonight's show. Yep, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Come on, Jimmy. All right. Uh, I'd like to uh, yeah. like to start off tonight with this panel. Uh, any questions to the panel tonight, to the panelists here tonight? I'd like to start off with uh, Jonathan Wilkes. Jonathan. Hello, oh, thanks you? for having us on here, Will. <laughs> I know you're going to have to work tomorrow, but, uh, you know, your sighting, when was that sighting? My original sighting yes. was in 1992 up in the Berkshires. Now, have you? How many times have you gone back there? Oh, many times, but for a while I didn't go back there. For well, how long? Uh, it was probably a good eight to ten years. The, uh, the event itself was pretty traumatizing, but it was more of the ridicule and stuff that made me just want to not revisit the subject. It's, uh, back then it was a lot harder to discuss paranormal activity, Sasquatch activity, UFO stuff. It's a little bit more uh, accepted by this generation than it was in previous generations. I think there's just a lot more information out there now, so people are a lot more open-minded about it and it's an easier subject to discuss. I know the feeling. I had the uh, same problems sharing my experience for many years, as a matter of fact, until I was close to my 50, I was able to share my experience that I had in Puerto Rico. So I know the feeling, I know the stigma yeah, that sticks around with that. Yeah, it's great to be on the show here with you. Uh, oh, you know, for the first time. Yeah, I know. Uh, um, I was think I was supposed to be on your first show, and my schedule prohibited that. Um, but Dave and I like coming to these events and sharing our experiences and our knowledge with others so that we can... Um, help other people have experiences and learn more about this uh, this great mystery that everyone seems to think uh, doesn't exist. But these creatures are living right underneath our noses, right here in in Squatchachusetts, right in our backyard. Right in the backyard. Now, Ronnie LeBlanc. Hey, Willie, how are you, brother? 
it's great to have you here back at the Greater New England UFO Conference. Yeah. Where it all started. The great night. For, for me and you. Yeah. It did. Yeah. It did. It's unbelievable to have this for another seven years since its inception. And, um, you know, Susan has worked and all the volunteers have worked really hard. Really, really hard. It's come a long way. Yeah, it's a great event. Tomorrow's going to be fun, too. That's right. Anything that you're working on, because I saw a great article on the Lowell Sun. Yeah, we have a new show coming out for Travel Channel uh, next month in November, late November. A uh, new book on the way, and then a, a beer, too, with a Bull Spit Brewing Company called Sasquatch Spit. <laughs> Sasquatch Spit. <laughs> that is going to be a first. That it's is strangely good. delicious. <laughs> I bet it is. <laughs> I bet it is. You know, um, I'd like to turn it over to Cheryl Costa. She is one of KR, KCR's own. She has a show on Tuesdays. I hope we can pass the microphone around. Hi, Willie. Hey, pleasure to have you here. Thank you. At the Greater New England UFO Conference and finally at the Paradigm Matrix. Finally got to meet each other. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Anything new that you're working on? Uh, we've got a new book coming out uh, sometime between now and the end of the year. Uh, we took all 237 articles that I wrote for the Syracuse New Times about UFOs and we've condensed them all into one book. And it's going to be coming out uh, sometime between now and the end of the year. And it's basically a lot of information on sightings all across New York, the New York area? New York, and also in the later years of the, the later chapters, uh, we started branching out uh, to other parts of the country. There's UFO statistics, there's articles about disclosure, uh, all that kind of thing. And uh, it, it should be a good read. Uh, the editor who's going through it right now is going, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, you know. Oh, a lot of those, so, huh? uh, it, we hope it'll be a very successful book. Uh, these people do like stories, and this, this talks about it. It's called The UFO Beat, because that was my beat, UFOs for the newspaper. Great. Now, there is a lot of sightings also in the Pennsylvania. It yes, seems there to are. Be a, a hotbed also. Yeah, there are, yeah. and uh, it, 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 it's, it's got localities. Yes. Um, I did do, at this conference, we've heard an awful lot about the uh, Sasquatch down there. And I did a study of the places where I heard the Sasquatches were and started evaluating the amount, large amount of UFO sightings in, that, in those general neighborhoods. Great, great. Now I'm going to turn over the uh, microphone over to Mr. Alexander Petrikov. I know that he's on, way on the other side. But uh, Alexander, as always, has done a great presentation. How's it going, Willie? Hey, Thanks for having bad. me on. This is like, what, number five? I time on the show, something so. like that. <laughs> I believe so. You know, and uh, I also like to see and get the uh, listening audience involved. If there's any questions out there for these uh, speakers here, some of them are going to be speaking, uh, all of them, the rest of them are going to be speaking tomorrow. But if anybody's got any questions, please come up and uh, ask a question. It is a uh, open mic, open forum here. Got no takers, Alexander. But when is the uh, monsters, I mean, uh, cats, the lions of the... Lions of the East, yeah. The Hopefully East. By, uh, by the end of the year here. I'm getting kind of towards the end of that. And it's just a long, you know, the editing process takes a while. And I've been dragging my feet a little bit. So I'm kind of trying to speed that up a little bit. So yeah, it should be interesting. And like I talked about, it's, uh, it's about big cats in New England. Mostly the mountain lion phenomena, but also the small percentage of sightings that are the black panther, so there's something that's a little bit stranger than your average mountain lion, which we know there's a lot of sightings in the New England area of that sort of phenomena. So uh, the black panther element is just, you know, they call it alien big cats occasionally because it's kind of very unusual. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to uh, see if we could turn it over to my uh, other half of the sponsor, Dave McCullough. Hi, Willie. Thank you for having me out. Oh, it's always Appreciate a pleasure. It. Always a pleasure. So um, your castings, I've been uh, bragging at work uh, about some of your cast out here. And where did you get those casts? These are all replicas of uh, actual incidents and 
famous cast from mostly the West Coast. Uh, replicas brought up Jeff Meldrum, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Cliff Barrett yes. from Finding Bigfoot. Um, yeah. The biggest one that you have out there is just a massive hand imprint. And where did that one come from? The hand is from uh, Washington State, Blue Mountains. Paul Freeman, I don't know if you ever heard of the famous Freeman film. Yes, yes. He actually, I got quite a few artifacts from him there. He's got a good knee print, knuckle print, some really small baby uh, footprints, baby Bigfoot footprints. He's yeah. actually got a lot of evidence. He's um, definitely underrated in the field of long-time research. Oh, well, yes, he is. He didn't get his due. But and in my opinion, one of the, come up with one of the, some of the most... No, that's fascinating. It's such an impressive handprint. It's probably the biggest one I've ever seen. Yeah, it is. You know, it is. It is. You know, and along here, Mr. Dennis Stone. Oh, hi, Willie. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's great to see you as always, my friend. And, you know, I, I heard that there was an unfortunate incident that happened at American Stonehenge. Yeah, it's uh, probably the worst vandalism we've had in about, since we've been there, since 1955. It happened on Sunday uh, probably Sunday morning or Saturday night, and uh, so it's under investigation and everything, but it caused a lot of damage to one of the main features at the site called the uh, Great Stones uh, Table or the Sacrificial Table. It's about a 9,000 pound stone and it was uh, heavily damaged, so uh, they were kind of heartbroken about the whole thing. It is so sad to hear about this. I am, uh, of course, completely disgusted at the vandalism that was done uh, to your property. And you were there just a few weeks ago. Before yes, I time. was. Yeah. Yes, I was for the very first time. I had a yeah. terrific time. I'm planning to uh, bring my son over. Yeah, you got to come back. I know yes, Ronnie was he's, up there too. He's just really to, interested yeah. in going up there, and I hope that uh, yeah. many of us could go as a group up there and mm -hmm. also show our support to Dennis. Oh, thank you so um, much. Dennis has been, uh, of course, real, really, really good to us. I believe we do have a question. Sure. Um, Can you state your name, please? Uh, I'm Josh Freeman. Hey. Nice to have you here at the conference. Yeah, this is good. And what was your question? Um, a few different questions, I suppose. Um, okay, um, I used to uh, uh, build part of Stan Freeman's website. And uh, right before he died, he was asking if uh, he was trying to compile, like kind of like uh, Cheryl, you put together a book on your articles, and he was working on putting together a two-volume book on all his MUFON articles. Um, I talked to uh, Jan Harzon. He's like, oh, if you come to California, you can go through our files or whatever. And, and uh, Stanton said, oh, if you come to Canada, you can go through all my stuff. But, uh, I mean, nothing's happened, so it's like, how, how do you compile it so it could, the book could actually get published? You know, it'd be a good, be good to give this gentleman the microphone. We didn't really hear that question. Can you give him the microphone, please? I couldn't hear anything. Oh, you couldn't hear anything? Yeah. yeah. Can you come up? So we hand the microphone. Sorry about that. Yeah. Can you repeat your question? Please. Okay, so um, Stanton Friedman, uh, he was working on putting together a two-volume book on all his MUFON articles he ever, uh, conference papers, um, but they're in California and they're in Canada. And it's like how to compile, compile it so it would get published. Um, similar, to what Cheryl was, similar to what Cheryl was talking about, you compiled all your articles um, into a, a book. I believe somebody is working on that. I believe, yes. Okay, no, I'm not, well, and I'm not I'm making just, that up. Yes, Paul, you know, here, I, I was a, once made a uh, ill-advised foray into book publishing, so I, I kind of have a nodding acquaintance with how, how to do that. Is that your question? Okay, well, I, with something of the volume of Stanton Friedman's records, I'd say you would need several editors, okay, to go through and decide what should be published and in what format the book should be designed, okay, what should be in what order, that sort of thing. 
and, and then that, it's, it's uh, quite, that's quite a project. And then you'd have to find a publisher, decide whether you wanted to self-publish or go with a standard publisher. There are advantages to both. And, uh, but the first thing would be to, a t a set, uh, to a, assemble a committee at this point, I would say, of people with um, some knowledge of the subject and who may be uh, experienced uh, at uh, such projects. There are more of those people than you might think. So that, that, that would be my advice as a <coughs> book publisher, former book publisher, all right? It's kind of standard, so, all right. All right. Okay. Oh, okay, sure. How's it going, guys? My name is Drew, and I was just curious about how credible you consider Bob Lazar to be and his whole story about Area 51. It's a great question. Anybody want to take that? Anyway, take the question. Okay. Dave McCullum. This is uh, just my opinion. I think he's pretty legit. I think a lot of the stuff he t spoke about uh, years before has come come to fruition and come become true. So, seems to know a lot about um, and pretty brave. My mind is a brave guy. I think he came forward just to protect himself, so they know if anything happens to him, it's that's just my opinion. Any any other opinion? I, I've watched a, a bunch of uh, things on him. Of course, heard the pros and cons, and um, and Stanton Friedman's uh, study of him. And you know, we do know that he's lied about parts of his background. I think he's a smart guy. I think he's telling a real story, but I don't think it's his. This is just my bizarre theory: is that uh, I'm not I'm not even even close to a physicist, but he's used physics terms incorrectly. And, and I mean, even just a basic college level person taking a physics course would, would if you listen close, you'll see he uses a few terms incorrectly. Um, so I don't think he's a physicist. I think he's a smart Edmund scientific kind of guy. You know, I've known, I had a good friend like that. Wasn't a mechanic, but if you were broken down, he's the guy you'd want to be with. You know, just a real, you know, so I think Lazar is smart. But for some, and I think he was where he said he was, but my theory is maybe the person who really was the physicist working on all this stuff um, couldn't come out. And Lazar was the guy who did it for him. That he was working there in a different capacity that had nothing to do with you know, what he said, but he got into that world and, and became the guy to make it public but I don't think he himself is, is anything close to a physicist. Okay, great, great. Now, anybody wanna give their answer on that question also, which was a great question regarding Bob Lazar? Yeah, I don't know Bob Lazar personally, but we have a lot of information. Now, just as one who has rubbed elbows with the intelligence community in my own military service, uh, <clears throat> no, nothing that comes out of sources like that really should be taken at face value, I shouldn't think. The principle, at least when I was in the because I go back about 40 years, admittedly, was you release accurate information from inaccurate sources and accurate, inaccurate information from accurate sources and it keeps everybody guessing and everybody loves a mystery. So, and I know that he's refused to come on our show. Uh, we're not the biggest show out there, but we're, we've been on for almost 12 years, are pretty prominent. Everybody's been on. Stan Friedman was a regular. All the big headliners were on, but he would not come on. Well, because there was, we don't ask easy questions. Uh, now, I don't know if we're giving ourselves too much credit, but I just, I, I just, I take Bob with a pillar of salt. Let's put it that way. Okay. All righty. Cheryl, what's your opinion on that? Uh, I've looked at Bob Lazar a couple of different ways, but I also look at it from the standpoint, I'm a journalist, and uh, uh, George Knapp and I have talked briefly about him, and everything George seems to support, I tend to look at George's evidence and I seem to support it. I think something that was very telling, a recent documentary was made by Jerry Cor uh, or, uh, by, uh, Corbell, I don't remember his first name, um, and there was this interesting scene where uh, 
Lazar said something particular, and suddenly the little town that he lives in filled up with more government agents than you can throw a stick at, okay? More than there lived in the town, okay? Well, and the cute slide that came up after this scene of showing all these different agencies that were swarming the town, somebody believed Bob. He also had his house raided by the FBI. Mike, you have anything to say about Bob Lazar? Um, not too much. It's kind of out of my range of the part of the ufology I dwell in. Um, it's been an interesting case. It was probably, you know, one of the earliest cases I first started following on, you know, sightings and unsolved mysteries and all this stuff when it first came out. But it's with anything. I, I think time will tell. There's parts of it that's, like Bill was saying, I, I do believe he's got some involvement with it but he might not be telling the whole truth, which is a huge problem with any of the fields we all work in. Anybody else? I believe that Mr. Stan Friedman also investigated Bob, Laz Bob Lazar's story, and I believe in San, uh, San Alamos, he did uncover his um, tax, uh, part of his tax return, I believe, and that actually proved that he, he did work there. So, so he, there is part of the story where it is uh, legitimate. You know, you know, one point, this is Cheryl again, one point you have to keep in mind that he has stated the reason that he had to come out visible was so that he could stay alive. That's right. And I've heard that sort of thing from other people over the years, other circumstances, that if they came out of a classified environment and reveal, it was like a whistleblower, the only safety was to be out all the way about it uh, so that they couldn't make you just disappear. Correct. 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 Anybody else? Any other questions? We're almost close to the break, to the bottom of the hour. Um, anybody else want to dwell on that? Not at all. No takers. All right, there you go. I uh, don't know who the guy was, but there was a program that um, Bob was, uh, did take him out in the desert, and they did see a graph that night, the night he said it, and certain dates. It seemed like, how did he know that, you know? Correct. I believe that was Roger, Roger Lear. Yes, Roger Lear. Right, Wally. That's right. That's right. So regardless of his story, I think it's interesting if you look at the impact of his story kind of on popular culture. I mean, this is a guy who, with the latest documentary with uh, Jeremy Corbell, they were featured on Joe Rogan, which is one of the largest podcasts in the world. I mean, I know people who Correct. don't even know anything about paranormal subjects, and they were talking about this episode with Bob Lazar and Jeremy Corbell on there. And I think if you put that into the context of the Storm Area 51 thing that happened, uh, this subject is really kind of blowing up and really a lot more people are becoming interested in it. So, I mean, even just look at last year at this conference compared to this year, yes. like the amount of media coverage that's been talked about with the UFO subject, Bob Lazar, right. Area 51. I think that's really interesting. That's right. You know, that was great. And uh, we've got about 30 seconds to go into the commercial break. But great, interesting panel here with the uh, questions and uh, answers from... The Greater New England UFO Conference. This is William Miranda, live at the Greater New England UFO Conference, and we'll be back after these commercial messages. Choose, and choose wisely. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Welcome back to the Paradigm Matrix. The Paradigm Matrix. Where fact and fiction collide. Prepare yourselves. Join the show by calling 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Those around the world use Skype name KCOR Radio. 
Call now. Tweet your thoughts anytime by using hashtag KCOR at KCOR Radio. Escape the matrix and join the conversation live in our chat room at KCORradio.com. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. And now your host of the Paradigm Matrix, Willie Miranda. Willie Miranda. And welcome back to Paradigm Matrix, live from the Lumberstar Greater New England UFO Conference 2019. I believe we have a question from our panel, from one of our, one of our guests. Yep, is it on? Yes, it is. Okay, my name is Steve, and uh, I really enjoyed the Bigfoot discussions we've had tonight. Uh, my question is, uh, there's been a lot of sightings, not just by someone walking through the woods, but by people actually going out there uh, for a mission of trying to spot the creatures. Uh, what efforts are made to try to track them down once they're seen? And, and to add on to that, um, some type of a, maybe like a bloodhound or something like that that might be able to follow a scent. Is, is there anything like that that's been done or tried? Any takers? That would be a great question for okay. Dave McCullough. Dave McCullough. Or Alexander Pernikoff. Uh There have been, I've heard of a couple incidents that uh, tracking dogs have just lost the scent in a swamp. Or of other areas, it's just impenetrable. But um, usually, when we go out, you're not going to go out af right after a sighting because usually it's it's gone, it's long gone. So we we try to draw one in, not from a sighting, but just by being out there, uh, becoming part of the woods. We used to go out and just get right out of the car and start doing stuff. Now, but we know that just don't work. So we just settle in for a while, become quiet, and let the woods kind of come alive and everything else knows you're coming in anyways, your scent and your vibrations coming in. So um, they're not gonna be out foxed and out tricked. And I, ju I was just recently told of uh, an incident that the property owner had their cameras messed with because they knew they were trying to get tricked. And um, I've heard in a couple other cases that the cameras were, this was someone that had regular activity. As soon as they put the cameras out, the activity stopped and this went on for a couple of weeks, and then they, his cameras were literally turned up towards the sky and twisted up and away from the trail he watched. And so he took them out, and then the activity picked up again in a couple of weeks. So it's, I think it's their frequency. They can pick up on the equipment, the frequency the cameras give out, and uh, camera traps like that. There are, there are a couple of odd rare game camera pictures, but... Um, that's just my opinion. Every other animal and creature seems to walk right up to it and oblivious to it, but for some reason, there's, uh, these things can pick up on it. That's just our opinion. Okay, great. I know Alexander wants to chime in on this one. I think it's an interesting point that Dave brings up about the fact that by the time you get to a location, it's already gone. I mean, if you look at a majority of sightings, they're usually people seeing it as it's fleeing or trying to get out of the area. Very rarely do you have the encounters where it's something banging on the side of the truck or the house or throwing rocks at you. That's like a minority of reports. Most people see it, it's crossing a road, it's running away in the brush, it's just getting away. And I think a lot of the times you have to think if these creatures exist and their sole purpose is kind of staying away and staying undetected, they're going to go into the areas that people don't go in. So, uh, for example, an encounter that a lady I spoke to in Northern California said they had found tracks in the winter outside of her property in the mountains. Uh, they tracked it, and it went up basically a rock cliff that none of them could do without specialized gear. So, I mean, it, that's kind of the, the, what you'd be dealing with, and especially in areas where you just cannot get in. I mean, I've heard of stories in Colorado where they'll follow tracks, and it just goes into a patch of thorns and bushes that you just wouldn't be able to get through unless you were about to cut through it. So these things are thinking outside the box, how to stay undetected, how to stay elusive. So uh, people have tried everything from cages to bloodhounds to putting out pheromones of gorillas and other apes to hopefully attract things. Uh, it seems like when you're out there, you're basically on their terrain and it's up to them if you get an interaction. It's not, at least in the majority of cases, it's not, you're not the one dictating if something's gonna happen. It's totally the opposite way around. And that's actually how, with some of the great apes, with gorillas and chimps, I mean, 
Diane Fossey took her months until she even saw a chimp or in gorilla research, same sort of thing. It's, it's up to these creatures to let you know if they're comfortable enough and then they'll reveal themselves. But before that, you'll just hear sounds and noises. And this is, like I said, a behavior that's known in apes. So a lot of the similar stuff kind of parallels with the Sasquatch, which is interesting. So, yeah. That's a great question. And they're gonna, it seems like they're going to initiate the contact. Now, Ronnie, I wanted to get your thoughts on this because all like the UFO camp and also the, the Bigfoot camps or the crypto camps, uh, there seems to be two sides to this. Uh, many of them think that they're in the, they're in the camp there where it's a, uh, uh, the missing link for one of these great apes that are uh, extinct. And then there are other ones uh, that are saying that it is a multidimensional creature and that this creature happens to travel from, from, from port, using a, a porthole to, to go and traverse to another side. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you start to question, they're obviously physical because they're leaving tracks, right? They're leaving hair, uh, people having visual sightings, but then they're doing things and so uh, evasive that you start to question, are they something else? Because they're pretty damn good at it. Um, so I think there is something kind of going on with it. I just, I go back to what the Native Americans were talking about, that Sasquatch has one foot in this realm, the physical realm, and one foot in the spiritual realm, which is defined spirit as interdimensional, what have you. They, they definitely have the ability to uh, either cloak themselves or refract light. Um, there's just been too many stories of, of this where they can just literally disappear. So what can do that? I mean, there's definitely some animals that uh, be right in front of you and you wouldn't be able to see them. They, they camouflage so well. And it could be a, a, a camouflage um, you know, capability that they have or it could be something totally different that we're starting just to understand now. And we're, talking also, we're also talking about a creature that is basically has used nature to its advantage. I mean, you like Dave? Um, if I could add one thing about the dogs, hitting on what Alexander was saying about the dogs, there was um, a couple of famous incidents in Arkansas where right after a recent sighting, they brought a half dozen bloodhounds of the best tracking dogs, and it, they refused to even... They get out of the truck and jump back in the truck. They don't want nothing to do with it. Just by the scent and the spelled trouble, and they hopped back in the truck. It so means business. These are the best, best tracking Correct. dogs, too. That's just another incident. Correct. No, that was a great question. Great question. Thank you very much. Now, I believe Linda has Let me pass the microphone. Hi, I'm Linda Miller Costa, and I'm the co author of the UFO Sightings Desk Reference. Um, I'm a professional librarian, and I've been pretty quiet. I let my, my wife Cheryl do most of the talking. Um, but as she says, I'm the scientific brains behind our research. And I'm going to be doing a, a book, uh, I'm going to do a bibliographic study of UFOlogy just in the 21st century. And as a librarian, librarians look at information and how it's organized, how the people who are doing the research interact with each other, um, you know, whether, uh, what, what is the rigor of the science that is being applied. And I think one of the problems is uh, with UFOlogy is that it's, it's, not, it's not maturing into a science and into serious research in that, uh, we publish, and uh, we're publishers of Dragon Lady Media, and we've been interested in, in trying to expand the outlet for scientific research. And um, what I guess I wanted to ask the other, all the gentlemen on the panel, um, I know you like the stories and the anecdotal information, but would you be interested in trying to uh, become more scientific, if, if we started a, a UFO studies journal, would you be willing to write papers and submit them and try to develop more of a peer review for each other as they do in serious, not serious, but academic and traditional respected science? Because we want people to take UFOlogy seriously, 
but we also need to start taking ourselves seriously more and stop looking at each other's competitors for attention and you know just selling books etc but also developing the field and having more diversity more women involved we women approach things differently you go to most conferences the majority of the people there are women and yet you look on the stage and uh, well you know here we are um, how can we improve this are you interested in improving this are you interested in ufology becoming a real research field you know Linda, that's a very excellent point excellent um, also you know, and to answer your question, our organizer. Yes, I know. <laughs> you know, there's a lot is, of women uh, doing the work behind yes, the scenes. Yes, you she's, know? she's doing the, the work behind the scenes. But you know, we have many great women in this, <laughs> in, in this field. Yeah. You know, and and we just have to keep pushing, and and give them the limelight. You know, and give them the opportunities. Well, you know, I was on Facebook, and there was. You know, you're saying, well, you know, that uh, which which research is tougher? And you know, we're doing statistical research, and you know, a couple men came up. Oh, but doing field research is tougher. And my question is, is this a macho contest? And nobody answered me. Well, that is, <laughs> that goes to show you. Oh. <laughs> that, that goes to show you. But you know what? We're we're we are there are more opportunities out there, and. Of course, women are being uh, are getting more involved in this field, and we do have a question out here from this young lady. What is your name? Yeah, here's Julie from the audience. Oh, I'm from New York. I'm from Boston. Oh. <laughs> All right, Julie, what's your question? So, um, interesting segue to my question. So I was just wondering, as researchers, how you are feeling that the internet is impacting your research. I mean, is it bringing together more credible stories, or is it is it just piling things up that are making it more muddled with Photoshop? And you know, I mean, I, I just I just think that it's probably changing your field of study. And I'd love your thoughts on on is it helping? Is it hurting? And um, and how you're all dealing with that as researchers? Excellent question. Thank you very much. Who wants to take that one? Mr. Alexander Petikoff. Great question. Uh, as you know, one of the younger people kind of in this uh, sort of uh, field or world, I guess you could say, uh, I think the internet is, is twofold. You know, first of all, it does connect people. I mean, I've met so many wonderful people, and I think as Dave and John were kind of alluding to earlier, and John mentioned his presentation, you know, there's, you, there's so many places now that I can go, and I can contact this person that I know just from this mutual love of cryptozoology or Bigfoot or whatever the subject may be. And it brings people together in that sense, but it also divides people because you have so many different people competing for who can get the most likes or who can get the most views on certain things. And it creates wedges. And also, the hoaxes just kind of take off. So, you know, I'll see pictures that have been debunked three years ago. Suddenly, someone posts them on a Facebook group with 10,000 people. And then for the next two weeks, that's the only thing I'm going to be seeing on the feed. And I'm like, didn't we go through this three years ago when this was debunked, this particular sea monster video or Bigfoot picture, you know, trail camera picture, or whatever the case may be. So I think that's definitely one of the downsides, aside from everyone kind of competing. And uh, But it does bring people together. I'd say overall, I think it brings more good than it does bad, because ultimately the internet have revolutionized the entire world. I mean, I, I grew up on the internet. And I think it, it, does, it does more for this field than it does bad, but I don't know what others have to say about that. Bill Hall. I mean, it definitely aids in, in research um, and finding people who were there and around uh, the story. Uh, but, you know, photos are, are just always difficult. Because just because a photo isn't, isn't doctored, if you don't know what's going outside of the photo, uh, you know, context is everything. So uh, photos are tough with and without social media if you're talking about that aspect of it. But I, I agree with Alexander that, uh, that just the, the amount of people that you can connect to an incident or case uh, is unbelievable. Um, but, you know, as always, just as fast as the Internet can help, it could it could you know, cause havoc, as we all know. All right. 
Mr. Paulino, this was an excellent question, by the way. Do you agree? Yes, it was. Uh, a very excellent question. I think it ties in with some of the points Linda made. Correct. I the, agree. The problem with this field is that there is, um, how, how would you do peer review? Very important academic principle in which your peers uh, of say, a similar academic standing will review your work and compare it with theirs. Even at this table, we have, we're speaking out of many, many different frameworks. I think we'd have to start really at square one, so to speak, with uh, the disciplined thinking that science can bring that's all too lacking in this field, and then work up to a point where there, there would be enough commonality. But the problem is the paradigm, the name of the show is the paradigm matrix. You know, what paradigm do we use? In 50 years of doing this, the paradigm that we generally use is way too narrow. We put labels on things that we can understand that may have nothing to do with the deeper reality that they're attempting to describe. So we have our work cut out for us, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. There is a new, brand new inst uh, institution, I guess you can call it, of the uh, Contact and Consciousness uh, Institute, uh, CCRI, uh, which is, uh, I only heard about the other day when I was asked to be on the advisory board of it, but uh, the founder is Ray Hernandez, who founded the um, one of the founders, certainly, of the uh, uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences. That's a mouthful. But th these are beginnings to a, a, uh, a disciplined approach to the paranormal. Now, we may be dealing with things that are outside of science. Many, many people believe that. I'm one of them. But that doesn't mean science can't expand and, and that undiscovered science cannot uh, reveal itself. And uh, so again, I think it's, uh, these are excellent ideas, but we have to start from square one. It was a great answer, Cheryl. One of the problems we ran, Linda and I ran into when we started publishing, publishing statistics, all these um, field investigator types came out of the woodwork and told us, well, you don't really understand. It has to be done this way. So we said, wait a minute. We're taking a different approach. We're using an epidemiology study to study the bigger clusters. You're looking at individual sites. We're not looking at one ant. We're studying the freaking ant hill. Okay? And that was the different approach we took. But you wouldn't believe how much resistance there is in this community to studying the same topic but from a different viewpoint. That's correct. Nick Stevens, what are your thoughts on that? Um, it's a hard question for me to answer because I, I would like to see the answers. I think like everybody at this table, we'd like to see it scientifically proven. Um, I don't think the people who have gone through this need to wait for that answer to get help. I've, uh, I believe there is truth. I believe there are things out there that's provable but I'm not going to make people wait for those truths before they can get help, before it's more acceptable. Um, so, you know, you, can, you work with experiencers, and there's a lot of stuff that you can't prove, that science will never prove it, because their own memories might not be true in a scientific, uh, f factual way, but they're very true to them, their experience was, and there's a lot of components that go into it and mix that up and muddy the waters. So they're not lying, but they're not telling the absolute truth. So the science is a hard part to throw into that, or at least the science we understand now is, you know, a platform for it. Excellent, excellent. You know, we were, um, we're talking about Stanton Friedman. Somebody had a question regarding Stanton Friedman. Stanton was one that really put boots to the ground and go out there and investigate as far as going out to actual libraries, correct, and, and, and doing all that instead of uh, doing what some research, researchers do out there, which is data mine. They go through the Internet and just, and just filter through information. And I believe you guys agree, correct, that... Um, those, I mean, there are research, so-called researchers that, that, that do that, that do that and, and, and do not put in the actual real work. And I believe this has made the internet almost like a double-edged sword, that you really have to be careful of what you, or what you, 
what information you're getting out there. I don't believe Chair Acosta wants to chime in on this. Okay, a, a number of years ago, there was a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, okay? And one of the key things he talked about in there, you have two horns of, of philosophy with this. You've got the scientific academic horn that's looking purely at, the, at what they consider to be the real. And as soon as you start getting over on the other half of that, of that model, of, where you have to start looking at things a lot differently, all of a sudden they throw you into the category where, well, you really can't study that in the academic world. You have to go to some place like a monastery to study that. Okay? I spent seven years in a Buddhist monastery. That's the only way I got to certain answers. Okay? And that's one of the biggest problems we have in this community. I have a, I've done a number of talks on consciousness, and I've had more than one person come back and just throw it up, well, without the hardware, you can't, we can't explore the consciousness. And, I, I, you know, E.T. didn't always come to us in tin cans. E.T. used to visualize itself in a burning bush or come down and talk to you in a, in a desert someplace, okay? Right. So there is, there is, and talk to any tribe, they come down different ways and appear. And I think we need to start, stop looking at the, the technology phenomena and start looking at the fact that E.T., uh, if you talk to Dr. Ray Hernandez, he'll tell you, the abductees, they're turning us all into mystics, okay? Because they're teaching us to look at a bigger, we're connected to them and they're connected to us. Paulino, your thoughts on that? Yeah, just very briefly, uh, I'm always amazed at how we associate advancement with technology. You know, and uh, as I often say, who, who was the most advanced nation in the 1930s? Nazi Germany. How did that go? I'd much rather have be dealing with people who are advanced morally and spiritually than technologically. I can give you one in that same range. When I lived in the monastery, at one point I was in a man monastic debate. We had a high lama there. He was asking questions to the other monks and nuns who had been in class with him for weeks and weeks and weeks. I hadn't been. And he asked this one particular question, and I gave him an answer when nobody else could. And he asked five or six of these kinds of questions over a period of about a half an hour, and I gave him an answer when nobody else could. And I was the novice who shouldn't have been able to answer the question. But then he looked at me and he says, why can you answer that question? I said, well, it, it's quantum physics. And he looked at the audience of the other monks and nuns. He said, yes, and we've had it for 2,600 years. Hmm. That's great. That's great. Well, listen, we've got about a minute left to the close of the show, and I'd like to thank everybody here who participated in this panel, all of our speakers and the speakers for tomorrow. I know that Jimmy's complaining he didn't get any time, but he'll get plenty of time tomorrow. That's right. That's right. And I'd like to thank everybody who attended this, uh, this show tonight. Uh, this is Willie Miranda at the Paradigm Matrix, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>